Hey everyone, it's Kendall from the Recording Lounge Podcast, and on today's episode, I'm fulfilling an old request that someone gave me months ago, and I thought it was a great idea, and I finally have a great song on which to demonstrate it. Today we're talking about mixing indie pop drums. Now, what am I talking about with indie pop? I'm talking about this sort of hybrid, real sample drum sound where uh, the drums are recorded on a real kit, but they're processed and mixed in such a way to almost sound like a drum machine. So I'm going to start all the way at the recording. I'm going to talk about what we used, how we recorded it, some of my philosophies about working with this type of sound, and all the way through the mix. So first things first, I'm going to play you what the song sounds like. This song is called Supernova by Channel 13. Check it out. God, you control me Your touch so real, lips so holy The starlight's shining for me Burning so bright I'll never look away Oh, you pull me back Gravity gets to your light again And I'm losing track Every moment So first things first, I want to talk about the recording of this because a lot of this starts at the recording. As you know, I'm a big proponent of the philosophy that the source is king, and that is absolutely true even here when doing these sort of really processed modern pop kind of drums. It still starts at the source. So let's talk about the source. Uh, for this, we are using my CNC kick drum. So this is a 24-inch kick drum. I'm going to play you the raw kick sound right now. So this is our inside mic, our outside mic. Uh, this is just the sound of the kick. Got a little bit of the basketball thing going on, but it's a good sounding kick. So this is a big kick drum. We have it somewhat dampened uh, with some towels, I believe. Uh, we're not using a pillow. I'm not a big fan of the pillow inside of the kick drum. It, I think it kills it a little too much. Um, inside, I'm using a Telefunken M82. And outside, I'm using a Charter Oak E700, which is a large diaphragm condenser. About center on both. I mean, not, nothing crazy on positioning. I'm using an API 560 EQ. Let me take a look at my notes and see what I was doing there. Looks like I was just adding a little bit of sub down at like 31 and 63 and taking out a little bit of 125 and 250. I'm also running the pair through an API 2500 plus. So there's a little bit of compression going on, but not a whole lot. So yeah, that's the kick chain. Uh, the preamp was an AML 1073, which is just great 1073 copy. I love it on kick drum. It's maybe not my favorite on a vocal, but I love it on kick drum. It's got a lot of low end. Uh, some Neve clones kind of have more mid range. Some have more top end. Some have more bottom end. Uh, that's one of the reasons I like the AM AMLs on kick because they have a lot of bottom end. So that's our kick chain. For the snare, we're using a Ludwig Acrylite, and we're actually using a pretty small snare. I think it's about five and a half inches, maybe five, but it's tuned really low and it's dampened pretty heavily. We've got a Telefunken M80 on top, which is definitely my favorite snare mic, and a Sennheiser 441 on bottom. For the chain, I'm using BAE preamps for top and bottom, and I'm using an SSL EQ 500 series on the top mic, not on the bottom, just on top. And the only reason I really use that is because because I typically find that the Telefunken M80 has a little bit too much 4K, 5K, can get a little bit thwacky there. So I'm pretty much just doing that. I'm adding a little bit of top end but then uh, as a shelf, but then cutting back some of that 4K with one of the mid bands, and that's it. Um, I'm also using an Empirical Labs Distressor on the snare top. So this is our snare top and bottom mic I'm playing. This is totally raw.
And that's already a pretty great sound coming straight into the DAW, right? Like, obviously, I'm using a little bit of EQ and compression, not a whole lot. I'm probably doing a little bit of EQ on the BAE preamps as well. But again, not a lot. The source itself has that sound, that modern kind of like sound that almost sounds like a sample. Also, the drummer is playing really, really well. It's very even. All the hits sound the same volume. Uh, the tops of the peaks are not going crazy in terms of um, inconsistency. It sounds really good. On our hi-hat, I'm using Peisty hi-hats. Let me check my notes here. I am using Peisty Medium 602 hats. Okay, so these are from the 602 series or possibly even the Modern Essentials series. I don't remember, but they are the uh, Formula 602 medium hi-hats. Okay, they're 14 inch and I'm using a Sennheiser 416 shotgun mic. Uh, it's something I've been getting into the last couple of years using a shotgun mic on hi-hat. The isolation is really good and the bottom end is not, which is great because I don't really need any bottom end in my hi-hat, but I do need isolation and I need good top end. So here's our hi-hat mic. You can hear how there's not a lot of snare or other things in there. It's getting mostly hi-hat. And I really like using shotgun mics on hi-hat in situations like this, where the hi-hat's doing a lot of like articulate, you know, 16th notes with accents and things. I really need to pick up that detail on the hi-hat, especially when we're considering pop or indie pop or anything that we kind of need that like hyper real sound. Um, I'm probably going to be using more close mics in general than I am room mics or overheads. So I got to make sure my close mics are on point. I'm not using any toms in this song. There are no toms whatsoever, programmed or real. And one thing I wanted to bring up about this is that we made sure to cover the toms. So I've got pillows on top of the toms and I've got tape on the bottom heads of the toms. So they're not just sitting there rumbling away. That really helps clean up your overhead sound and your room sound because there's not just this like just kind of rumbly sound in the room because the toms are covered and they're not vibrating at all. Now I could have just taken out of the room, but I think we were thinking we might do some Tom overdubs and we decided not to. So on our overheads, I'm using Sound Deluxe U99s, which are kind of U67-ish microphones. I love these mics. They're probably my favorite, most versatile condenser mics that I own. Um, unfortunately, the company's no longer around. They were purchased by Universal Audio. So the current version of this mic is produced by Universal Audio, and it's called the Bach 67, uh, as designed by David Bach. For this chain, I'm using an A-Designs Pacifica preamp and a Retro 2A3, which is kind of a stereo Poltec. I'm just adding a little bit of top end. That's all I'm doing. And at the end of the chain, I'm using a Fatso, a, U a UBK Fatso specifically, not the Empirical Labs version, but the UBK version. I'm using this to kind of tame some of the clickiness of the transients and some of the top end. Um, it's not doing a ton of compression, but it is sort of smoothing out some of those clicky transients on top. So let me play you my overheads. Uh, I also will say we're using Peisty Signature Crashes for this, uh, which are nice and bright and pretty. They almost sound like samples. You can hear the cymbals have a really beautiful like upper shimmer to them and that's how they sound in the room. Um, I'm not getting gobs and gobs of snare drum or kick in the overheads. Uh, I'm mostly getting hi-hat and crashes. And my first initial impression of this uh, that I can hear again now while going over it is that they're a little too wide sounding. I'm probably going to end up narrowing that in the drum mix to make them not sound quite so wide. <laughs> Now, in terms of room mics, I actually recorded some stereo room mics and another pair of stereo room mics, a PZM mic, and then something that I call OTK, which is over the kick. But in the mix, I actually didn't end up using the stereo rooms at all, but I will play them for you. So here's a stereo ribbon mic, an AEA R88, placed about 15 feet from the snare. 
and it's running through a Millennia preamp and an API 5500 EQ and a Chandler Zener limiter. It's a great sound as is. I mean, you can hear the essence of the kit as a whole. That's one of the reasons I wanted to play you this sound because you really can hear what the kit sounded like in the room. Fat kick, fat snare drum, really bright, shimmery cymbals. So I have another pair of room mics. These are Sound Deluxe 195s. I am using the fat switch. These are going into a buzz preamp, and I'm not doing any EQ on these, but I am going to a smart C2 kind of SSL style compressor on the crush mode, which is kind of this like slightly crispy kind of distortion mode uh, that gives it just a little more excitement. It's almost like an SSL equivalent of all buttons in. Um, so it's kind of aggressive, fast compression, but it sounds really great. Here's the spaced room mics. These sounded a little weird on this session. I think one of them maybe got a little too angled, so it sounds kind of awkward with the kick being a little bit more on the left and the snare and hi-hat being more on the right. I didn't even use them in the mix, but again, you can hear these and get an idea of what the kit sounded like in the room. Notice how there's no tom rumble or any of that in the room itself. It's very clean and clear. It's just kick, snare, and hat, and crashes. Now, on the ceiling, I have a PZM mic. This is just a regular Crown PZM mic, nothing fancy. And I love what this does to snares and toms. It has this really aggressive mid-range and it compresses really well. Um, for this PZM mic, I don't actually know the model off the top of my head. I, it's just the, the, the crown one that you've seen a million times, <laughs> the square looking one. I'm running through a Chandler TG2 preamp, and I'm going through a transient designer into a standard audio levelor. So this is pretty aggressive, but it's a great sound. really compressing a lot uh, probably more than I originally intended actually <laughs> but I'm gonna do some work in the mix to help bring back some of that transient it's definitely getting crushed but yeah that's our PZM sound and uh, you'll see how I use that in the mix I wanted to play you just really briefly our OTK mic this is a microphone that uh, typically I use a large diaphragm condenser for something relatively flat I don't want it really hyped in the bottom or in the top for this I'm using a Sennheiser Mark 8 which is a Honestly, kind of boring sounding mic, but that's exactly what I need for this. Really clean, great transient response, really low noise, and just kind of flat overall. But that works super well for this position. The goal of this mic is to kind of get a close room mic, if that makes sense. So it has a little bit of everything because it's right over the kick drum. It gets a little bit of kick and toms and snare and hi-hat. Sometimes it can get a little bit too much ride, but... Again, in this setup, we didn't even use ride cymbal. We just had two crashes, hi-hats, kick, and snare. We overdubbed the ride, which is another trick that I do a lot of times when recording pop, is avoiding recording all the cymbals at once. Sometimes we just do kick, snare, hat. Sometimes we do kick, snare, hat with crashes. Sometimes we do all the cymbals separately. So we just do kick and snare, and we overdub hi-hat, crash, crash, ride. It really just depends on the setup, and it depends on the kinds of tones we're trying to get. But in this case, we decided to leave up the crashes and the hi-hat and just overdub the ride. But we'll get there later. So here's the OTK mic. So this mic is also going into a Chandler TG2 preamp. Then I'm going into a transient designer to actually reduce some of the sustain and increase some of the attack. And then I'm going into an Empirical Labs distressor to kind of crush it back again. 
So all together, our raw drums sound like this. And honestly, it's a pretty darn good sound, even just raw out of the recording. But I'm gonna show you how I hype this up even more and make it sound modern and clean and interesting and cool. One other thing I wanted to mention before we get started mixing is these drums are hyper edited. So every single hit is edited perfectly in time with the grid. That's another part of this sound of making it sound more electronic, more poppy, more like a drum machine is editing it like a drum machine. Now, to me, I'm not one of those people that thinks editing kills the feel. To me, I think feel comes a little bit more from dynamics than it does from timing. Now, of course, this is not true in all cases, but in the case of something like this, I think it feels great. Even though it's hyper edited to the grid, I still think it sounds great. So let's start with our overheads. For pop or indie pop type drums, typically I'm not looking for a lot of body out of my overheads. In fact, I usually take most of it out. So in this case, I am using uh, Waves S1 to narrow the image a little bit. I am pulling it down to about 65% width. This is without and with. And then I'm going to use a Pultec. This is the UAD Pultec, but you can use whatever. I am using this simply to pull out a little bit of low end. I already added top end on the way in, probably up at about 8 or 10K, but I'm now going to use it to just attenuate low end. I'm running this Pultec at about 100 hertz, and I have the attenuate on 6. Now that sounds like a lot, but again, the function of this overhead is top end prettiness. That's it. I don't need low end from it. I know it sounds really thin because it is, but trust me, it works. Now, another thing I'm doing to make it even tighter is I'm using a low band of expansion with Pro MB. So I have this band reduced about 10 dB, but it's expanding triggered by the low end. So this will tighten up the bottom end even more. So this is essentially shortening the decay in my low end. This is all plugins off. And this is all on. Like I said, I know it's thin, but it's all about the function. In this case, it fulfills that function perfectly. So let's talk about kick. Um, I think I forgot to mention this, but I'm actually using a third mic on kick. I'm using a PZM mic inside of the kick. This is the Shure PZM mic Beta 91, I think, whichever the Shure one is that everyone knows. And this is really great for getting a little bit more mid-range texture on a kick drum. So this is what that sounds like by itself. It has kind of a nice throaty, like, go, go. Compared to my inside mic, a lot more scoop sounding, and my outside mic, which is just beautiful and thick and full. Now in this blend, I'm probably using the most of the outside and second most of the kick PZM and third most of the inside. So the inside is getting used the least. On my kick bus, so I'm routing all of these to a bus. I'm just doing a little bit of EQ. I'm doing a high pass with a resonant peak right around 40 or 50 hertz. And I'm cutting a little bit of low mids here, about 330 hertz. I'm also going to put a gate on this kick, so I'm going to use FabFilter Pro G for that. Now, again, you might be thinking, wow, that's really tight. You're kind of cutting off some of the low end length, but I'm going to be using some samples to help make some of that up.
Now, this sounds a little bit too scoop to me, so I'm going to parallel this kick to a bus and add some distortion. Uh, so I'm going to do a send here, and we're going to send to a bus with another instance of Pro G and an instance of Decapitator. So this is just helping us get a little bit more mid-range and crunch and texture on this kick. And I'm gating it even harder on that channel so that it really doesn't get too messy. Now I'm going to blend in a kick sample. And uh, this sample is one that I have actually made. And I'm going to use the sample and an instance of Transient Designer to shorten it just a little bit because it's a little bit too long. You can hear it's pretty subtle in the long run. Um, it is adding some of that subby like 808 thing. This is without and with. On my kick, I'm also going to pull out some of that basketball sound. Around 1K, 1.5K. Now, as soon as I add in my OTK, I'm going to get more mid-range on my kick because the OTK mic has a lot of knock. So I'm happy with that for now. I'm going to move on. Let's check out our snare. So again, I am sending my snare top and bottom to a bus. I'm going to add Pro G. For pop stuff, especially in this sort of world, I do gate pretty hard. I don't necessarily gate that hard for rock snares, especially when they're ringy, or rock kick drums when they're ringy. But for pop stuff, I do typically gate the close mics pretty hard. I'm also going to use a little bit of EQ, just a high pass filter, right around 150. And I am doing a slight resonant bump there, but not much. And I'm going to add a little bit of top end. Now I'm going to use UBK1, which is uh, kind of a clipping compression type plugin, to add a little bit of clipping and saturation to the snare. I'm also going to add an instance of Decapitator to get just a little bit more crunch. I'm going to go back and tweak my gate. So as you can hear, it's pretty crunchy, but that's part of this sound. I'm going to add a little bit of reverb on my snare. I'm going to use uh, the SP2016 reverb, which is kind of a nice digitally sounding reverb. In some situations, this can actually sound quite realistic, but I really like it for this kind of sound. It's from Eventide. Now I'm also going to blend in a snare sample, but uh, the snare sample that I found didn't necessarily work really well, so I needed to adjust it with a gate to tighten it up and do some phase rotation because it didn't seem to work with my snare very well at first. I really liked it on its own, but uh, so what I'm doing is instance of Pro G, and then I'm actually I'm actually rotating the phase about 80 degrees. So this is our snare sample. You can hear it's pretty crunchy and kind of wide, kind of a white noisy type of electronic snare sound. Without, with, and then with our reverb. Turn that sample down just a little bit. 
and do just a little bit of phase correction here. Kind of a weird tone on our reverb. I'm going to pull that down a little. That's better. Okay, let's check out our hi-hat. So for hi-hat, I don't typically do a lot. I do a pretty high high-pass filter. So I'm high-passing this at about 700. <laughs> and then I'm doing a little bit of Transient Designer and L1 to limit it. So here's our raw hi-hat. Here's my high-pass. Taking out all that unnecessary low end. Here's our transient designer to add a little bit of attack and cut some of the sustain just a little. And here's waves L1 to make sure it doesn't get out of control. It's not limiting very much. It looks like about one to three dB, just to make sure if there's a loud hi-hat, it doesn't get crazy. Okay, let's look at our OTK. So our over-the-kick mic, to me, the function of this mic typically is to add a little bit of mid-range glue that's not far away sounding. So for this, I'm going to be using AR1, great compressor plugin, and I'm going to be compressing this a decent amount. I'm going to cut just a little bit of bottom end and tip top. And for whatever reason on this mic, the hi-hat and cymbals are getting just a little bit harsh and peaky, so I'm going to use an instance of Soothe from Oak Sound. I'm listening to the delta signal on Soothe to show what I'm actually removing. So this is the area that Soothe is taming. Right around 4.5k. I'm setting the attack slower on Soothe because I don't want it to interfere with the attack on my snare. So as you can hear, this mic has a lot of great mid-range presence on kick and snare. Now for our PZM, I want to sidechain this to my kick and or snare. I think I'm going to try it on my snare first. So here's our PZM mic. It's kind of over overblown. So to combat a little bit of that, I'm going to use FabFilter Pro MB to do some expansion in my mid-range. This will help give me more mid-range and not pinch that attack so much. I'm also going to add a little bit of... FabFilter Pro Q to pull down some low end and add a little bit more mid-range. I'm also going to pull down a little bit of 700 something, 780 hertz to pull out some of this ringing tone that's kind of bothering me. Now, I'm going to gate this mic and sidechain my snare to it. So it's only going to happen when my snare is on. So here's my snare, and here's now my PZM sidechain gated to it. So I've got the range on the gate about 30 dB, so it's pretty much only being used for snare thickness.
Now let's talk about our drum bus. So I've got all of this stuff going to the drum bus, our samples, our reverb, our kick crunch bus, all of it is going to the drum bus. Again, I'm not using the stereo rooms at all, and we didn't use any toms. On my drum bus, I'm going to use a little bit of EQ just to add a tiny bit of top end and bottom end to kind of hype up these drums a little bit. For that, I'm using uh, the Kit BBN105 plugin, which is great. I am adding 1.1 dB on my drum bus of 6.8K and 1.1 dB of 56 Hertz as a bell. That's it. Not a lot, like I said. The drums sound pretty good as is, but I do want to do a little bit of compression to help glue them a bit more. So I'm going to use API 2500. I'm using the Waves version. I use both the Waves version and the UAD version. I like them both. They sound different, but they're great. I'm also going to do a little bit of parallel compression on my drums. So this is the Universal Audio 1176 Rev E, which is my favorite version of the black panel 1176s. And I love the UAD plugin of that. It's, to me, the best version that they make. I also like the Rev A, but the Rev A and Rev E, that's, that's really the stuff. So I'm compressing this pretty hard. I'm using two buttons in. Not all buttons, I'm using the 4 and 8, which I think is probably about the same thing as all buttons, or at least close to it. But anyway, here's just uh, my crush sound. I'm going to do it pre-fader so you can hear just the crush. This is helping to add more crunch, more mid-range, more excitement. And yeah, I'm going to blend that in with my main drums. Uh, here I'm doing about minus 20 compared to my drum, my drum bus fader, which is at zero. I'm going to give it a little more. So uh, I didn't actually do this in the real mix, but I'm feeling like my kick drum maybe needs a tiny bit of uh, crunch in there that is stereo. So I'm actually going to turn on my stereo room mic. I'm going to use this one. And I'm going to do the same thing I did on my snare. So I'm going to put a gate on it and side chain it to my kick. So here's just the sound of my room mic side chained by the kick. I'm going to really try to shorten it up so it doesn't get too much hi-hat or anything. I'm also going to put a little bit of a high shelf to get rid of some of that hat. So I am just doing this to get a little bit more stereo crunch on my kick drum. So I'll put it back in context and blend it in so you can hear what it does. Here I'm blending it in. So this is without it. And with. It's subtle, but it does make a difference. It adds a little bit of sort of stereo width and excitement to our kick. Now, I mentioned our ride cymbal before, and instead of doing this with the main drums, we overdubbed it. So we just recorded a pass of our overheads, and I'm taking out a little bit of bottom end, just like we did on our overhead channel. This is what that sounds like.
So I make sure to send this to my drum bus as well. So it's getting treated just like it were a regular drum mic. So here's our drum bus with our ride overdub. Now, the last thing I wanted to talk about is my master bus, because even though it's not technically my drum mix, it is affecting my drum mix. So on my master bus, I'm using an SSL compressor from UAD. I'm not really compressing much, only about 2 dB. <laughs> I'm not compressing very much, only about a dB on some of these loudest parts of the song. Let me back up just a little bit to see if it's doing anything earlier. Yeah, it's just barely tapping the meter on the drums, but that's something I want to make sure that my compressor on my master bus is doing, is actually being affected by the right things. I don't want my vocal to be crushing my master bus compressor. I want my drums to be affecting it because if my vocals affecting it, then that's probably not going to work rhythmically for my whole track. But if my kick and snare hits are affecting it, that will then make my entire music pump with the right envelope. I'm also using an instance of UAD Ampex just to get a little bit more glue and saturation, but not much. This is without it. And with it. It's pretty subtle. I'm not really doing a whole lot on it. I'm barely even hitting zero on the meters. And then I'm using a Chandler Curve Bender, also from UAD, adding just about 1 dB of top and bottom to my whole mix. Chandler's also doing 1 dB of mid side, so it's turning up the side channel a little bit. And I'm going to add just a tiny bit of EQ on my drum bus on the side channel just to give it a little bit more width. So I'm adding a high shelf just on the side channel. So I'm just adding about 2 dB on the side. And here's that. And that's really it for these drums. I know it seemed quick, but you know, the source sounds are great. The drummer was great. It's been edited super tight. We have a really clean source signal because we didn't have toms. We didn't have too many cymbals. The beat is pretty repetitive and the drummer played it great. So let me play you all the drums before with no processing. and our full mixed kit. So I'm gonna play this in context with the music. This is our full instrumental. you enjoyed this episode of the podcast i hope you learned a lot about mixing for indie pop music now i want to just reiterate that a lot of these moves seem very simple and it's 
because they are. This didn't actually take that long to mix, and it's because we really focused on our source sounds, making sure we got a snare drum that has that kind of character, making sure the hi-hats that we chose have a nice, tight, articulate chick sound, making sure our cymbals were nice and bright, making sure our mic choices were good, making sure that we added a little bit of color on the way in using some driving preamps and some compression. But nothing I'm doing here is crazy, really. Nothing I'm doing is out of the ordinary. Perhaps the side-chaining the snare to the PZM and the kick to the stereo room might be a little bit new for some of you, but it's part of that kind of 80s meets modern type of sound, that gated room sound. And it's really useful when you're side-chaining because you can make sure it will only open when the actual close mic triggers. It's not just gating all the time. I sometimes do this with kick or snare or toms. It can be really helpful for getting more room, kind of explosive room sounds on toms uh, without having to keep your room mic up all the time. And a key element of mixing for pop or indie pop is making sure things don't get too cluttered. There's a lot of vocals, a lot of synths, a lot of guitars, and you don't have a lot of room to compete with the drums. You need to make sure that they have big, solid low end, nice, pretty top end. But as you saw, you also need to make sure they they speak in the mid-range to have that nice, exciting crunch, but then they don't get too in the way because we've used expansion and gating and side chaining to make sure that it doesn't speak in there too much. It's not ringing snares, you know, it's not a really long, aggressive reverb. It's a pretty short reverb, and the snare sample is short and also kind of gated. So, hope that was interesting to you. Let me know what you think. Join us on Discord. You can check out recordingloungepodcast.com. Uh, right on the front page is a link to that. Special thank you to all my Patreon supporters. If you'd like to support the podcast this way, head over to Patreon patreon.com slash recording lounge and make sure to check out our youtube channel youtube.com slash recording lounge i'll talk to you next time see ya